There we go. All righty. Go ahead and start letting folks in. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. We're going to get rolling in just a couple minutes here. But before we get started, I would love if you all could introduce yourself in the chat um, and say your favorite season and why. As we know, our seasons are very important to our ag here and would love to hear from you all what your favorite season is. I'm a big fall, fall gal myself, so I'm very pleased that it's November. Um, but maybe you're a spring person. Maybe you like the, the blooms. Um, yeah, for folks just joining, if you could go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat and say your favorite season and why, I would love to hear it. We're going to give folks a couple more minutes to pop on in here and we'll go ahead and get started. I see Aaron introduced himself in the chat, but no favorite season, Aaron, come on. Uh, I see Renee says fall and autumn because of the changing tree colors, awesome. Carrie loves spring and fall, yep. Oh, back county skiing in winter. Okay, Aaron, I see, I see. Awesome, awesome. I like this from Jim Rumsey. Favorite season is winter when I have some time to rest. Absolutely. Nothing good, but like going to sleep on a cold winter night, you got all your blankets on. Yes, I love that. <laughs> and your dog. Yes. Oh my gosh. My dog gets so cuddly in the so winter. I love it. All right. Yes. Snow melt season. Oh, I love this, Chelsea. Snow melt season when the days are warm and it smells like dust and fresh water outside. Very fitting for our, our water, our water like adjacent advisory today. Awesome, awesome. Favorite season is spring from Grace. For some more folks petering in here, we're gonna get started in just a minute, but would love if you could introduce yourself in the chat and state your favorite season. And we'll get going in just a second here. Awesome, fall, fall with great color. Yes, see lots of fall, my people. Awesome, awesome. Well, please continue to um, introduce yourself in the chat, but I think we will go ahead and get started with our PowerPoint here. Um, just to introduce myself briefly, my name is Caitlin Blockus. I'm a project manager here over workforce development at Valley Vision, and great to have you all on here. Um, moving forward, I wanna do just some quick housekeeping. If possible, if you could all um, enable your video, that would be lovely. We love seeing your gorgeous faces um, and wanna see them here with us this morning. Um, if possible, please stay on mute unless you are called on to ask a question. We'll have some time for Q and A and things like that, um, but please stay on mute, um, helps keep things rolling here. And then if you could submit all questions or commentary into the chat, we actually find our chat during these advisories events is fairly robust and you know lots of great places to make connections. Um, so please feel free to put any commentary or questions or connect with folks in the chat. And as you saw coming on, this meeting will be recorded and will be provided as some of our post-meeting materials. Um, so all of this will be recorded, the PowerPoints will be provided um, and we'll send that out um, probably sometime next week. Alrighty, I will go ahead and pass it over to Renee John at Valley Vision to do a little welcome introduction. Thank you all. Thanks, Caitlin. And um, we're also joined by Danielle Sousa on the Valley Vision team, who's helping to run the logistics and the behind the scenes. So I just want to acknowledge that. And thank you to everyone for being here with us this morning, our speakers and panelists and um, audience members. We're hoping this will be an, an interactive, engaging advisory discussion. So we encourage you during um, each portion of the event, if you have questions, you can put those in the chat. And then um, after presentations, we'll have an opportunity to take questions from the audience. And I'm joined today by my co-host, um, Carrie Peterson is the Regional Director of Employer Engagement for Agriculture, Water and Environmental Technology. And I wanna give her a chance to say hello this morning. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining in. Um, again, I'm Carrie Peterson. So uh, my title probably doesn't do justice to what um, I, I'm involved in. Um, I work with the 15 community colleges from Sacramento to the Oregon border, and I work with their ag departments, their faculty. Um, I work with our industry partners to ensure that our students are getting the skills that they need to be gainfully employed once they leave our program. Um, so I, I really kind of try to 
to connect industry with our colleges to provide um, a pipeline for our industry partners to have some really highly qualified candidates that um, can go to work for them after they've come through our program. So um, I'm excited about the topic today. Uh, we certainly, um, in California, we we have really suffered with this drought and um, trying to pick a, a topic for today. We, we came upon the fact that, you know, drought and water use um, is certainly a timely topic, but it's something that um, has kind of stood the test of time for ag uh, as we work to continually use less and less water and try and find other ways to kind of hold on to the water that we do get. So um, I welcome everybody and I look forward to um, lots of great information today. Thanks, Carrie. And this um, advisory is brought to you through Strong Workforce Program funds through Los Rios Community College District. This slide shows the multitude of supporters and partners who are part of the Strong Workforce Continuum of providing career technical education to our region's residents and students. Um, you'll see other partner colleges listed there, the Centers of Excellence we'll be hearing from shortly, as well as the four workforce boards that make up the capital region. And to go over the agenda we have for you today, we're doing our welcome and introduction right now. And thank you, Caitlin, for the icebreaker. After this, we'll be hearing about California water history, drought, and student certifications uh, from um, two uh, professors who work in this field. Then we'll have a labor market overview from Aaron Wilcher from the Centers of Excellence, and we'll have an industry panel discussion. We will conclude with opportunities to partner from Carrie Peterson. And we hope you can stick with us for the full two hours. And again, we're intending for this to be engaging. So if you have questions at any time throughout any of the presentations, please put those in the chat and we will um, make room for those questions to be asked in the discussion. And with that, I wanna introduce to you, Jim Rumsey and Dave Andrews. So I will start with Jim first. Um, Jim received his Bachelor of Science degree in Agricultural Engineering from UC Davis and his Master of Science degree in Agricultural Engineering from the University of California. He has previously worked as a farmer and in research and technical services for a large, large food processor in California. He currently works as an ag consultant and an adjunct professor, professor at Woodland Community College, where he developed applied water and water management courses. Jim is also a veteran and contributed to recovery operations after Hurricane Camille. Dave Andrews has been a professor of horticulture at Consumnes River College since um, August of 2020. He has an AA degree in horticulture from San Joaquin Delta College, a Bachelor of Science degree in agriculture education um, with a plant science focus. He has worked in nursery landscape industry since 1985. He's a licensed C27 landscape contractor, a certified water efficient landscaper, and a certified eco landscaper through Rescape. He is also the owner of Trinity Gardens Landscape Services. So Jim and Dave together are going to be providing our keynote address, and I, I think Jim is starting, if I'm correct. That would be correct. Thank you. Okay, so here we go. I, I need to, uh, oops, share my screen. So let's do this and let's, wow. Go over here and share my screen. There we go. Wow, I'm getting advertisements. Okay, here we go. Um, Carrie asked me to, uh, talk about really uh, three things today. I'm gonna to zip through this. Um, um, she asked me to give a brief history of California water. Can everybody see the screen? Let's try that first. Can you see yes. my cursor? Okay, good. Uh, uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about drought in California. And then Dave and I will, after his presentation, will tag team on serving student industry needs. So uh, if I were to have about 30 seconds to introduce California water, this is how I would do it uh, with this one slide. Most of the water that we get in California uh, comes up here. Most of the water that is used in California, ag, environmental, and human urban 
uh, is used down there. And most of the water comes at the wrong time. And that really kind of sets the stage for California water. I'm gonna add one more, a short introduction down here. Good old Mark, Mark Twain. Water is for fighting, whiskey is for drinking. And I tend to agree with that. Um, I'm gonna start the history part of this uh, at Gold Rush. Obviously there were, uh, there's millennia of uh, water history before uh, 18, before the Gold Rush, but uh, we'll dive right in here. And uh, this is a, for you educators, is a horrible teaching slide, but it works here. Uh, I'm gonna divide the history of California water into four eras, if you will. And uh, the first one is what's called the laissez-faire, um, pardon me, era, uh, started around the gold, gold rush, ended around the 1880s. And basically what was going on there in terms of uh, water was uncoordinated, uncoordinated actions. Uh, the, the miners, um, people that were diverting water for various uses. Um, and, and so it was kind of a mishmash. Now my family was involved in much of this. So I'm gonna sneak a little family history um, in, in my presentation. And this will be the first one. My forefathers came from Ohio and uh, both of them, uh, my uncle and my, uh, and his brother my great great grand uncle. And my great grand uncle settled the head of the Cape Valley eventually. And he did what most people have been doing uh, for millennia, um, Indians as Spanish. And he uh, diverted water from Cache Creek. And uh, believe it or not, it's still there. It's called the Rumsey Ditch. Uh, but that's what was going on back in that time frame. The next era historically is normally called the, um, well, I'm gonna call it the local organization area, uh, era, excuse me. And that's basically when people starting, started getting together and forming um, irrigation districts, um, municipal water supplies and, and what have you. And, um, and there's a lot of other stuff going on obviously, but I'm gonna go back to my family again. One of the very first um, irrigation districts that was established in California was in fact established in Yolo County. And um, that person diverted water again from Cache Creek um, and built a series of uh, canals that still exist today. And in fact, one of them went right through the property that my, and it's still there today, uh, went right through the property that my uh, family farmed for 140 years. It's called the Maple Canal. It's, it's all dirt. Uh, water comes, uh, the water comes from uh, Lake, um, uh, from the Indian Valley uh, Reservoir. And um, uh, mine just went blank, the lake above that. Um, water comes down clearly uh, and it, I, you know, I make a phone call and screw the gate valve water gravities onto my wallet orchard and, and I irrigate. And again, that's, that's still there. The next area, historically, we call the hydraulic era. And, and that's basically when, you know, big government, big state, big uh, feds got involved and they started building, excuse me, dams and reservoirs and, and the such. Uh, Central Valley Project, um, uh, you know, they built Shasta Dam in 44. Um, and the Central Valley Project uh, services primary, well, the dam, then all the infrastructure goes down to the Bay Delta and on south, uh, serves primarily, but not exclusively, uh, ag water users. The State Water Project uh, was approved, the, um, uh, where we go, Orville Dam, was built in 68, again, infrastructure leading down through the, uh, through the Bay Delta and on south. And the State Water Project um, primarily, but not exclusively, uh, serves urban water uses. That one goes actually uh, over the grapevine and down into the uh, uh, LA Basin area. Now, along about 1970, 
is the beginning of what we call the era of conflict. And, and that's basically when we started to realize and, and try to respond to um, some of the problems that were rapidly becoming apparent. And those included um, water reliability, reliability, water quality issues, uh, environmental restoration and, and protection type issues. So that's a really, and of course that one's still going on today. There's your quick, pardon me, history of California water. Uh, I'm gonna move on to droughts. Um, this is your official uh, US drought monitor, California drought map. And we give you the very latest information here because it was released this morning as of November 2nd. <clears throat> so that brings up the issue of, you know, what's a drought? And there's all kinds of, well, the first, yeah, just look at the map and you say, man, we're in bad shape here. Because this is what's known as an exceptional drought. That's a pretty big deal. Um, but the definition of a drought that I'm going to use is um, a shortage of water for a particular purpose. Now, in California, those purposes are generally ag, environmental, and urban. So, you know, at a specific location over a period of time. Uh, so I want to drill down on that a little bit right now. I'm going to be an ag user of water, and I'm going to be using it right here where I used to when I farmed. So there's my specific location. So how do I know I'm in a drought? Well, I know I'm in a drought at my specific location when I want my ag water, because my water district says, Jim, you're not going to get it, or you're going to get a third of an acre foot instead of three that I need to grow my wallets. Um, so that's how the ag water user normally knows how they're in a drought. And it's a long time before the map comes out. And now my family had a plan B for when that happened. And, um, and we had a local neighbor, we had an ag well, and we got our water that way for a number of times. If I'm an urban water user, and I am, now I moved back into town, um, and I'm right here. Um, and how do I know I'm in a drought? Well, frankly, I'll watch the news, okay? Because my water supplies as an urban uh, homeowner water user uh, has not been restricted. They're trying to get me to do that, and I do do that. You know, I stopped watering my lawn and I yanked about half of my food garden. But um, so again, you know, when you're in a drought, it depends on what kind of a user you are. Now, we're going to go through a quick one on um, the history, if you will, of droughts in California. And this, this one has some major implications. Uh, you know, here we are this year, we're in a drought right now. But if you go back to the time when um, uh, roughly the gold rush and particularly during the 20th century, you can see that drought periods, uh, you know, generally persisted two, three, four, five, six years. You notice they're also coming at more frequent intervals. But the biggie here is uh, if you go back into the medieval time period, we, have, we had droughts that lasted 140 to 220 years. So, you know, for the time I've been alive, that's what I'm used to. But on a historical uh, basis, uh, there, this is nothing, what we're going through now. Um, so what does that mean? Um, the water systems in California and much of the West, frankly, were constructed using a six year drought design assumption. Okay, I'm an engineer, so we do, do these kinds of things. Um, and, and, and that's the problem, frankly. Uh, six years without a, a period of recovery. And that's just not going on in a, in a long time history, it hasn't happened. Um, so that in part, well, if you, if you think past history as a predictor of the future, and, and I often think that's true, not always, uh, that's one reason why we're really beginning to feel the impacts of the drought periods 
because it goes back to that assumption that um, was the best we had at the time. Okay, so Kerry says, talk about how ag's responding to shortage of water. Um, I'm gonna talk at the field level about two things. One is over the last 40 years or so, um, California ag has converted from what's called surface irrigation uh, to more efficient, low volume uh, irrigation systems, how we get water to the crop, uh, such as drip and micro sprinkler systems. Um, and uh, those types of systems um, don't waste, if you will, uh, a lot of water. And there's been a widespread adoption by ag over the last 40 years. It's extremely significant. And I'll show you the results here in a second. The second thing that ag has done <clears throat> over the years to be more efficient is usage of uh, really fairly sophisticated irrigation management techniques. Um, irrigation scheduling or management basically means as a farmer, you know, when do I turn on my water? How long do I run it? You know, to water my crop or my trees. And, but more generically, irrigation management scheduling means giving the crop, the, you know, the plants or the trees, just what the water, what the crop needs. And that's what it's using actually. And giving it to the crop at the, at the right time. Um, and the right time is when that crop is just starting to stress. Um, now, <clears throat> 60 years ago, uh, when we irrigated, uh, we irrigated our walnuts uh, three times a year. I mean, that was our water scheduling sophistication um, during the growing season. And um, we, ate, we added an acre foot each time we irrigated by surface of water systems. Now we've come a long ways from that. Uh, and specifically um, in terms of determining how much uh, crop, uh, how much water the crops are actually using in real time. We have some methods now um, that are fairly sophisticated. And uh, more recently we have developed some methods that are in use uh, that gives us real time information on one, when the crop or the tree um, is in, in essence saying, hey, I want a drink of water. So if we can more closely quantify how much they want and when they want it, then we can irrigate. And that, that's a very sophisticated, it's in use. Um, and those are just two of the things that ag is doing to, uh, to save water. And, it, and here's the effects. Now, when I first saw this slide, it, it kind of blew me away because and this goes from 1960 to 2005. I didn't update it, but uh, gross water use, that which the farmer orders, um, is actually has gone up a little bit. Then when the drip irrigation thing started being widely adopted, it's actually trending down. And that's pretty significant because the acreage has increased during that time. Uh, urban water use is you know, on a slight increase yeah, but Dave is going to fix that in his next talk, hopefully. <clears throat> so how am I doing for time? I don't know. Uh, so what are farmers doing today? Because that's really bad today. I'm okay on time. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'm about ready to wind up anyway. So what are they doing now? Okay. Right now, today, farmers who are really being hurt by drought are doing, can do a number of things. Some of these things that are going on are what are called water transfers, where you find a willing set, seller, the farmer, uh, and is and a willing buyer. Normally, another farmer uh, could be a water district, and so there is that water transfer. It's really not that simple, but sometimes when you don't have enough water, uh, you're willing to sell it. Uh, another is developing a second water source. Now, that's what my dad did, frankly. Uh, you know, 60 years ago, we had a neighbor. Uh, we used surface water. When we didn't have it, we turned on his pump, okay? So you can start drilling wells and good luck on that one because the well drillers are really, really, really busy right now. It's quite expensive. 
Now, some farmers today even are following their land. What that means, if you're growing rice and you've got a hundred acres that you grow and your water source company says, you know, you're not gonna have enough to grow a hundred acres of rice. So what the farmer would do is fallow a portion of that land for which he doesn't or she doesn't have water. So instead of growing a hundred acres, he or she's gonna grow 50. And there are some other things going on. This one's maybe a little bar bizarre, but some of them are uh, considering converting ag land, to, uh, ag land to other uses. And one of them would be maybe farming solar panels. I don't know. Now, what I did as an urban type is I stopped watering my lawn. My lawn, my lawn is now my lawn is now California gold. Okay, it's not brown. Now, so Dave and I are going to tag team on that. Here is a slide that I always leave with my students at the end of a, oh, somewhere you'll have the list of resources that I use. And when I, however you get it, it'll be in a document. If you wanna click on any of these, it'll take you right to the resources that I use frequently. Uh, so you just go click once you get it. This one came out yesterday, actually. Now, I always leave my students with this slide, which I love, by the way. Hopefully you can all see it. It says, I think you youngsters need to start thinking about what kind of world they're going to leave for me, there's Willie, and Keith Richards. Now I was really proud of that slide. And then one student says, who's Keith Richards? I went, oh my God. So if you don't, there's Keith, okay? He plays with the Rolling Stones. Now, unfortunately, both of, both of these gentlemen are about my age. Willie's a little older than I, and believe it or not, Keith and I are the same age. So I'm gonna leave it at that. And I don't know what my time was, but I'm done. You did great. Your timing was fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I think we're going to hear from Dave next. And if you have any questions for Jim or Dave, you can place them in the chat while Dave does his presentation. We'll take questions after. Well, thanks for having me. Here I go. So <laughs> I'm laughing at Jim there a little bit. Um, so I, I'm more on the urban side. Uh, thanks for, for having me speak today. Uh, and, and I'm just one of uh, a bunch of horticulture professors around the state. We're all doing the same thing and trying to serve industry and address our water issues um, as best as possible. I'll let you know what we're doing at Cosumnes River College. And uh, this kind of is, is a a little bit near and dear to my heart just because back when I was in high school, I actually started out as an apprentice well driller. I was working for a well drilling company. And, and my job at the time was to uh, rehabilitate uh, residential wells and smaller ag wells. And I would do a lot of sounding. And so we're looking at uh, back in the mid 80s, about wells that were 160, 180, you know, 200 foot deep was, was considered pretty deep in the San Joaquin Valley, the Lodi, Stockton, Manteca uh, area where I was working. And uh, you can see every year as I was working for this company, these, these uh, aquifer levels going down. And so I already had experienced that early in my career. And then somewhere I, I, I tripped on something and got into landscaping. And so I've been in the, the landscape side of things um, ever since for about the last 30 years, uh, in addition to being an, an educator. And But as I continued uh, in my education and then professional consulting and work with water and water management and irrigation, we can see that trend. And so uh, continue, and, and even the last several years, because we get our water uh, as many of you may know, we get uh, in Sacramento, about 60 to 65 percent of our water comes from surface sources in a what we would consider average year. But the remainder is going to come from our aquifer or ground sources. Well, in drought, it 
flips and we get 60, 65, up to 70% of our water is now coming from our aquifers where the surface water is not adequate to give us that supply. And of course, when it's we're pumping it out of the ground, you know, out of sight, out of mind, as long as the faucet comes on, uh, we're in good shape. And we've recognized, at least in the industry side, for decades that this is an issue and we see our aquifer levels dropping on average some places less some places really extreme but on average about a foot a year if you think about that over the last 20 years we've lost 20 feet of aquifer resources and that's significant and that's leading us of course to to some serious issues not not to doom and gloomy today, but uh, it, it certainly is uh, some extreme challenges. So speaking from the horticulture and landscape industry side and urban agriculture side at, um, at Kasumas River College, of course, our program is focused on landscape design, construction maintenance, uh, tree care and urban forestry, and then of course, irrigation and water management. And now we've expanded into sustainable agriculture over, as we've seen, the, the farm to fork movement, really not much of a movement. It's really uh, uh, becoming a uh, or has become a viable industry and a, a, a great career opportunity for a lot of our students uh, coming out of our local uh, agricultural programs in our urban areas. Um, and so. Uh, from my perspective, because I've been involved in California water, we address water conservation and efficiency in, in all of our courses. We've, we've got about 16 courses, and at some level, uh, we're going to address water because if you're in California, you're not going to escape the fact that we're going to have issues with water and that we need to... Um, not just conserve, but the idea in my perspective is make the best use of the water we have access to. And, and that's the efficiency part. So our goal obviously is to educate all of our students, whether they're gonna be in the industry or not. I, I, I get a, a pretty wide range of students in our classes and whether they're a horticulture major, an ag major or a non-major, um, we're, we're all, and, and not just in California, almost anywhere you go, water is typically an issue. And so we need to learn how to use water efficiently in our life. But obviously we're focusing on our horticulture and agriculture students, and we wanna create graduates and, and not everybody finishes the program. We have students that come in that wanna get a certificate. They wanna get a degree, they wanna transfer, but then we have a lot of folks that wanna change careers uh, they're in the industry and they'll take a class to, to gain knowledge or to gain advancement in the industry. We call those completers. They're, they're not getting a certificate or degree, but they're completing courses. And of course, the end game is to provide the industry with value uh, certification opportunities and good trained and knowledgeable, knowledgeable uh, employee candidates uh, for you all. So looking a little bit about what guides water use in California, the, the major one that affects a landscape uh, is what we call the Model Water Efficient Landscape Ordinance. And, and this is actually the daughter of previous uh, water efficiency ordinances back in 1990, AB uh, 325. Uh, M. Wello actually has come out of that uh, um, AB 1881, and it, it seems to get updated every few years and almost annually now. Uh, we do take a look at Cal Green, which is building codes, and then of course the emergency proclamation back in 2015 drought, which the governor uh, and the assembly has moved into the new regulations, this making water conservation of California a way of life. Um, and then we need to look forward too, because the, the legislation will not end. The Department of Water Resources will be coming out with outdoor water use standards uh, for urban use in June, 2022. So we're looking forward to seeing what those look like. And the urban retail water agencies are supposed to develop their objectives for water conservation by 2024. And then it's just gonna be what's coming next after that. So. 
when we look at these rules, uh, these ordinances and regulations, we uh, teach our students how to uh, develop landscapes through design and through um, proper plant selection, through proper irrigation design and management, uh, how to develop water efficient landscapes that are going to survive drought conditions. And so from my perspective, we wanna follow the ordinance that's required, but the ordinance that's out there applies to only certain projects. It's, it's been really uh, become more and more restrictive each year. The model water efficient landscape ordinance was initially for commercial landscapes over uh, 2,500 square feet and residential landscapes over 5,000 square feet. Well, over the years, that has now dwindled down to 500 square feet. And most anybody that's got some kind of landscaping easily can get 500 square feet for a new landscape or a retrofit. But the rules actually only go in motion if there is a permit item. So if there's something that we're installing that requires a permit. So, that's fine and dandy, but our perspective is that we want to teach good practices and good practices is to try to incorporate water efficient standards, regardless if you are required to by the ordinance or not is is the idea. And I coming from an urban perspective, we apply that to both landscaping and also urban agriculture. We take a lot of the lessons from uh, the model water efficient landscape ordinance. Uh, I've gotten my permaculture design certificate through Oregon State uh, in 2019, and, and we adopt a lot of those design techniques to capture water, um, and, and not talking about rainwater harvesting, although we talk about rainwater harvesting as well, uh, and it's different variations, of course, different communities have different rules on rainwater capture and rainwater harvesting, but the, the proper soil techniques, use of mulches, proper plant selection, uh, terracing and, and altering landforms in order to capture that water that falls either through irrigation or of course precipitation. So in terms of certifications, um, the, the big partnership that we've worked with over the last several years was the uh, Sonoma Marin Saving Water Partnership, which was through Sonoma County Water District or Water Authority. Uh, they had developed what was called the QUEL or the Qualified Water Efficient Landscaper Certification. And uh, I went through that training back in 2005, 2007, somewhere in there, it's been a while. Uh, but the idea was, um, and we'll talk about some of the other external certifications here in a second, but there's a lot of different industry associations and opportunities to earn external certifications that can tend to be a little bit pricey and are pricing some of our industry folks out of the ability to get this training and get certification that can be useful immediately in, in, in the industry. So we partnered up to offer uh, the Qualified Water Efficient Landscape Certification and that is an EPA water sense partnership. And so students who take our irrigation courses, and I've got uh, a, a landscape irrigation, drip and subsurface, and then a sustainable water management course. And with a couple other courses, you can get a sustainable uh, water management certification. And other colleges are doing this as well. Uh, but if they complete one of those courses, uh, the final exam is the QUEL exam. And if they pass that, they can immediately use that out in industry, uh, doing irrigation consultant, helping with irrigation design and performing the required audits under the model water efficient landscape ordinance. And in addition to that, there are some external certifications. We cannot offer the exam at this point. We're, we're working with partnering up with some of these folks um, 
there was an eco landscape or eco landscape California at one time. There was actually several groups working on a lot of the same things. And, and we had the uh, river friendly coalition. Then we had the eco uh, landscape California group. They realized they were doing a lot of the same things and a lot of the same people were on, were on both boards. So they got together and created, they, they merged and created uh, uh, eco landscape California and offered a eco landscaper uh, program, uh, which I got a certification in. But then of course there was a lot of folks in the Bay the Sacramento uh, Eco Landscape or River Friendly Coalition actually was an offshoot of what was going on in the in the Bay Area with the Bay uh, Coalition, the the Bay Friendly Landscape Coalition. They have all since merged and created Rescape, and they've changed their certifications. But now they have uh, uh, several of them. One of them is in regenerative horticulture, and so we take a lot of those type of guidelines, and and they're actually kind of based on a lot of the things that we're teaching already that uh, can prepare students to, to take their certification. The California Landscape Contractors Association has their water management certification. And once again, we teach a lot of the same things. Uh, we've yet, we got to kind of get together with them and see if they can take our classes and then take their certification. Uh, but there's a hands-on component for CLCA, which they have to actually complete over a year managing actual sites, which is excellent. And then the IA, of course, the Irrigation Association, which is the big association uh, for us nationally, has all sorts of certifications uh, in terms of certified irrigation contractors, uh, certified landscape irrigation auditors, agricultural irrigation auditors, golf course irrigation auditors, uh, irrigation designers. Anyway, they've got many. And so the idea, of course, is, is uh, making sure we're on the same page of providing that information, that skill set and uh, hands-on so that they can be prepared to take those certifications. And then hopefully uh, at some point we can partner up uh, where uh, we can offer an IA proctored exam after they complete a class. So uh, let's see what we're doing here. I'll wrap this up pretty quick. And in terms of serving students and in industry, Jim, if you want to pop back in here um, and, and tag team, uh, the, the idea, of course, is to um, provide opportunities for our students. In the end game is opportunities for industry, for you folks. So we have a lot of folks in our, in our industry that we're not necessarily seeing in the classroom, a, a great Hispanic population and other underrepresented folks, we are getting uh, increased uh, female presence in the program and going in that direction. And we wanted to increase that diversity and promote and increase the access to these educational opportunities for students, non-traditional students. And of course, your employees that are out there in industry and say these programs are here to build your skill set um, and, and grow in your career. Opportunities for employers by providing skilled and knowledgeable candidates and uh, ed providing educational opportunities for your existing employees. And then the really interesting thing is this, this um, seeing all this new technology that's being developed and all these great ideas from these students that come through our programs and have great ideas and promote that to create these new water efficient technologies and, and new and expanding businesses where we're not just providing career candidates for you, but also people uh, that complete our program and want to start a new business and expand our industry. So that's it for me, Jim, if, if you wanna pop in for that last part. Yeah, just real quick. Um... Most of my students um, are, take my class because they uh, want to become a pest control advisor, crop doctor, if you will. And my course does, our course does qualify as one of the courses um, that they can take in order to, to sit, for, sit for that exam. Um, and the other thing I'll comment on is, Dave talked about non-traditional students Man, I, I wish we could get more of those. Um, a, a non-traditional student to me means there's somebody out there in California who's interested in California water. 
and it's somehow they can find me. Normally that's or, or Dave or anybody else, it's word of mouth. And, and frankly, this is my opinion, there is a barrier to those kind of students because if you go in and try to register at a community college, it's a nightmare uh, if you just want to take one course. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if we made that known that there is a way around that, um, uh, so because community college, if you live in California, man, you can get in. You know, there's you don't have to go through the hoops and hollers. But I think many people don't know that. So a we need to. Uh, uh, drop that barrier, which is self-imposed, frankly. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you both so much. Um, I did receive a direct uh, chat question from Fred. Um, Fred, are you able to unmute and ask the question directly or would you like me to ask for you? Uh, either one, Renee, hi. Okay, the, uh, go ahead. So, uh, Jim, you mentioned on your walnuts that your former water use was uh, one acre foot three times per year. And, and now, you know, a number of years later, you've installed uh, more water efficient landscaping and irrigation. I shouldn't use landscaping, but irrigation systems. Wonder if you have any numbers on current water use, just to share with the audience, what's the, what is the actual benefit of the water efficient systems? Uh, make two quick answers. Uh, I sold my ranch in 2012 after 140 years, but because I'm an educator and stay in touch. Um, the benefit of, you know, these newer systems and management schemes is bottom line is you, you can use, you use, end up using less water per tree or per acre to grow walnuts. Now, specifically, you know, the, the numbers are drips 90% efficient and surface is maybe 75%. So you're looking at, you know, maybe 20 or 30% savings of water that you use. Does that kind of get you? Yeah. Thanks, Fred. And we have another question. question in the chat from Grace. Grace, can you unmute and ask your question? Yes, hi, thanks, Renee. Um, Dave, I was curious in your presentation, um, as I put in the chat, for um, certificates like Quell um, and similar certificates, do local nurseries engage with the students? Is local purchasing covered at all? Is that is that part of it? Well, we, we include, and we, we used to have a, a nursery program as well, but we weren't just getting the enrollment, and so, um, that got kind of merged in and we have a pretty good relationship with a lot of our nurseries and we do spend a lot of time looking at plant material, uh, especially watching as the local nurseries come in with more and more drought tolerant, low water use. Um, we're, we're trying to engage a little bit more with some of the, of the box stores because we do have a Home Depot and a Lowell's uh, uh, really close, the Lowell's right over the freeway from the college, and um, they there's a good turnover, so we we get a new manager every couple of years, and we got to redevelop that relationship, but they're doing an okay job. They're a little slow. I think they're basing their numbers on historic sales, and so you still see a lot of that, you know, popular 100 plants that we've seen for decades that are kind of these moderate and high water user plants, but they're slowly um, getting more uh, low water use and drought appropriate plant material in. Uh, the, the mom and pop nurseries are doing a better job at that, serving those needs, and, and even our specialty nurseries uh, are doing a, a really good job of that. And so, Yes, it, it, long story short is, yeah, we are engaging and we're, we're working with them, um, but we don't have, we get a few students that go to work for the nurseries every year. They, they still are a viable employer, uh, just not in high numbers. So um, we guide the program kind of very broad spectrum so our students can go out in, in any direction. <coughs> and, and get good career opportunities. So hopefully I didn't talk around that uh, question. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. 
Okay, at this point, we are going to go to Aaron Wilcher, a research director for the Center of Excellence. He's going to share some labor market information with us related to water management careers. So I will give it to Aaron. Thank you to our last two speakers. Hi, good morning, everyone. Let me manipulate the electronics here. Give me just a second. No worries. Thank you. So you're gonna see me kind of looking over here at my other screen where my notes are. I just wanted to give a quick uh, kind of observation. You know, it strikes me, we, we do a lot of this work with Valley Vision and uh, the quality of what we're doing is just tremendous uh, in my humble opinion. Um, the presentations that were just given, I think, are worthy of kind of statewide broadcast. And so um, at any rate, I think what we're doing sort of has impact beyond the region. This is kind of a mini conference it's turned into, and I wonder if uh, we should be calling it something else besides industry advisory. Um, so Renee and team, um, uh, let's kind of maybe think about that. I think this is stuff we sh we could probably have you know, hundreds of participants attending. So um, our organization, the Centers of Excellence provides labor market information and other kinds of technical assistance for the 100 and, is it 16 or 15? Uh, I, I, between Merced and the online campus, I never have the number right, but for the community college system around California, uh, community partnerships, such as the one that we have with Valley Vision. Um, I'm based out of Los Rios Community College District, but serve a north, far north region of uh, 15 campuses in 22 counties. And uh, our office is one of nine around the state uh, that's doing this uh, work. So I'm a research guy, and we're going to look at some data today. Uh, let me just actually, before I do that, point out, I'm not sure, maybe it comes in my next slide. Hang on just a second. So the kinds of research questions that we're often asking to support workforce education and training investment are the ones that you're seeing here on this slide. I mean, this is kind of our basic work. We're asking questions around what the outlook is for students if we invest in certain kinds of programs. What are the jobs? look like? What are they involved in terms of skills and duties? Um, what's the industry and kind of policy context, um, such as our faculty members were just um, kind of presenting the credentials required, so forth. Um, it's almost a benefit in some ways that we're not subject matter experts. We sort of come in um, uh, not as casual observers, but uh, hopefully as ones who can present um, uh, you kind of, you know, kind of a neutral point of view, at least most of the time, that's our intention. So the work that I'm going to show today is based on largely a report from my colleague, Ebony Benzing, who uh, worked with Yuba College and did a labor market study on occupations related to watershed management. It turns out, um, sort of going back and looking at the report, I think a lot of this is related to the work that um, Jim and Dave were talking about, uh, sort of engineering environmental services related to water, and I'll talk about that. Um, so I'm going to show you some data around the occupations, uh, what's called staffing patterns, I'll explain what that is, and then uh, the jobs postings in the Sacramento region that, that we pulled out. So Ebony, in her uh, infinite wisdom, uh, selected these occupations. Occupational research is kind of a standard set um, established by uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And so often when we're faced with a research question, I mean, the benefit of it is it's a, it's a widespread survey conducted by EDD. So we get data on the size and performance of the labor market. Um, the drawback is when you're trying to address a question such as um, like, you know, what, what are the, how many um, 
uh, water related environmental technicians or watershed management uh, services technicians are there and um, you've got to kind of fit that into the existing occupations these are the ones that um, ebony selected i think they're quite good um, there might be some other occupations that touch water management and um, technicians um, engineering services environmental services so forth but this is a pretty good start. Um, water and wastewater treatment operators are not included because uh, that's you know kind of in a different um, priority sector um, than this one. Uh, it's sort of community college speak, but um, uh, uh, the thing I want to point out here is that these occupations will be divided up into two categories. Uh, what we call middle skill occupations, those uh, types of work that require more than a high school diploma, but less than a bachelor's degree. So that's, you know, your um, hydrologic technicians, environmental science and protection technicians, and environmental engineering technologists. The others requiring a bachelor's degree are what we would call above middle skill. So it's just kind of a, a way that we're breaking this out a little bit, and I'll talk about the data somewhat. Uh, so, you know, basically when we do this type of work, one kind of angle of approach here is like, how many jobs, what, uh, what does this look like in, with respect to the total economy? Is it big? Is it small? Is it growing? Is it shrinking? Stuff like that. Um, there's a typo here. So the number down at the bottom on the left is the important one. 4,800 jobs uh, in this related area. And there's 1.2 million jobs in the greater Sacramento region. Uh, so we're talking about a pretty small number uh, overall, small but mighty, uh, right? Um, uh, kind of a modest growth rate projected uh, over the next, uh, we, we typically look at a five-year period um, and then annual openings is an important number uh, that represents both growth and turnover. So, you know, people retiring, people moving to other occupations, um, that kind of thing. That's accounted for in this number here. Um, more than half of the 4,800 are middle skill, so 3,200 and then 1600 or above middle skill. This chart represents kind of a wage picture. So the, the bars represent the spread uh, based on percentiles. This is again, the EDD survey, it's called the Occupational Employment Survey. So you get some data on what are expected wage ranges per hour. Um, we call this like the entry level, a median, and then experienced. Just a way to kind of think about this. Uh, the dashed red line is a living wage overlay. Uh, this is a pretty low bar. I mean, you call this mi minimum wage if you want. Uh, I could get into explaining what this is and how they come up with it. But basically, you know, one way to think of this is it's been a little while since I checked the median annual earnings for Sacramento region. It's probably around $58,000. So usually I'm kind of looking to try to, you know, a good uh, middle skill wage rate that I'd be looking for would be around 25 bucks an hour. And these middle skill occupations in this area are pretty much hitting that. Environmental science and protection is a little bit below. Uh, this 13, though, that's kind of like no one's living on that. It's not legal. <clears throat> um, so one of the things that we did was, um, uh, this is subsequent to Ebony's research, is just uh, this is called inverse staffing patterns. This basically just says what industries the occupations are working in. So for our bachelor's level occupations, uh, most of them are working in state and local government. I mean, like a big majority. 
70%. Uh, uh, engineering services, R&D uh, for the feds, and then uh, colleges and universities. Any of the industries that had less than a 2% share, we just put into this other bucket here. Um, but that gives you a sense of where all these folks are working. They're working for the government, most of them. Similar picture for the middle skill occupations. Uh, difference here is you can see this new category of engineering services. Mm -hmm. uh, when we look at the jobs postings data, you'll see that quite a lot of the uh, employers posting for these positions are in that category. And the others are all kind of the same. So we have this tool whose name I love, Burning Glass. Uh, it's a really interesting piece of software. They just got bought by another company. So we'll see what that looks like uh, when they, as they do their redesign. But this is a really cool thing. The tool crawls around the job boards or scrubs it is another way to, uh, that I guess they say that. Um, but you get these, these really um, interesting reports showing, uh, in this case, the top employers posting for the occupations that we talked about. Uh, this is the bachelor's level occupations. We talked about the top job titles and then the top skills. Um, so environmental services, local government, universities, um, uh, lab uh, uh, technicians. And then the, the top titles here, environmental scientists, research coordinator, uh, so forth. Uh, keep in mind, this is just a, you know, kind of a top 10 list. Whenever we do these reports, the, typically there's, you know, there might be a, you know, uh, there's dozens more titles, but this just gives you a snapshot um, at a glance over the last 12 months of who's posting and what they're posting for, for those bachelor's level um, occupations. On the middle skill side, um, environmental and uh, engineering services are looking for those technicians. And a lot of this stuff, even though those occupational categories are general, really touches water pretty strongly. So here are the job titles, uh, water rights specialist, uh, damage re restoration technician, hydrogeologist, um, principal hydrogeologist. Some of these may be bachelor's level. There's, there's sometimes some noise in the tool. And then you can see the skills that are listed here. If we were really diving in on this, and by diving in, I mean doing a study that took us like between four and eight months, we would heavily curate this with partners and really unpack what's relevant, what isn't, um, and specifically like where we're going. So this is kind of a touchstone, something I hope is a point of departure for the conversation today uh, and will be kind of shared out, but just know, you know, this is sort of a, a, a quick and dirty look. Uh, we put out something uh, sort of on another note, but a shameless plug. Uh, we put out um, a, a regular economic update that tracks what's going on in the economy. You might be interested to take a look at that and uh, stay in touch with us uh, regarding our work. Um, I'll paste that link into the chat where you could sign up for our newsletter and uh, get, that, uh, get that update. And uh, we are regularly tracking uh, jobs in carry sector, um, agriculture, water, and environmental technology. So thanks for the time. I'm happy to answer any questions, um, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks so much, Aaron. Um, just give it a second. If anyone has any questions for Aaron, you can drop the question in the chat, or you can raise your hand before we go to the industry panel. All right, great. Well, thank you for your work on that presentation. And if questions come up later, you can put those in the chat. At this point, we're going to go to our industry panel conversation, and we're delighted to have Tim Johnson, president, president and CEO of the California Rice Commission, uh, who also helped us on the planning of this advisory. He's a previous Valley Vision board member and is um, heavily active in uh, partnering with the community colleges and pipeline development programs. We also have uh, Megan Hartle, Director of Land and Water Conservation with Audubon, California. And we have Todd Manley, 
Director of Government Reg Re Relations, Northern California Water Association. Uh, we're pleased to have all three of you here to help us answer some questions related to uh, skills and pipeline development for careers in water management. Uh, so we'll start off the conversation with just having the three of you um, give some background on your organization or the organizations you represent as it relates to water management and anything else you'd like to share um, as an introduction. And, and Tim, we'll start with you and y'all can just pitch in. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks for having uh, me today. Uh, it's great to be back working on a Valley Vision project. Uh, it's also great uh, to be talking about community colleges. I am a, a very proud community college graduate, uh, and I think it was probably some of the best time I spent in education uh, and uh, really appreciate the value. I appreciate always the, uh, the professors that I had. They were they were the ones you wish you had when you were going through your bachelor's degree and you probably found again when you were going through your master's program. So the California Rice Commission, uh, the organization that, that uh, I head, uh, is an organization that represents all of the rice farmers in the state. <clears throat> so I'll be providing you some perspective from that. Um, we also represent the rice milling industry. So those are the folks that take the rice from the field take the whole off uh, and uh, go ahead and put it in a package. Uh, so the perspectives that we'll be providing to you today, you know, Renee, are really, what did the drought do for us? You know, what do we see? Uh, and what do we see for the types of skills based on, on what water means to us as, as agriculturalists, which is pretty different, right? I think then um, sort of historically, uh, there's still some of those historic jobs that are out there. Uh, but we're also seeing a, a new wave that's actually hard to fill of jobs in, in some more of the uh, technical uh, areas, as well as some, some of the areas of conservation. Uh, just as a matter of scope for folks, we grow rice on an average year, uh, about a half a million acres, and there's about 2,500 farmers of rice in the state. Uh, this year, uh, our rice production was down 20% because of the drought. And I know that was discussed earlier. Uh, Jim did a great job of, you know, we're the crop that we grow less of to make water available for others. Thank you. Uh, Megan, do you wanna introduce yourself next, your thoughts? Yeah, happy to jump in. So really pleased to be here today. My name is Megan Hurdle. Uh, I'm the Director of Land and Water Conservation with Audubon, California. It's a bit of a wonky title, but you'll notice that water is in there just because water is so important to birds and everything we do. Uh, and basically my job at Audubon is to oversee our statewide conservation programs. A lot of them uh, occur in the Sacramento Valley. And just out of curiosity, maybe we can use the little raise hand function how many people have heard of the National Audubon Society before? I got one, two, three. Okay, not bad, that's not bad. All right, I see more coming online. Okay, thanks, thanks for those. You would be surprised how many times I go to like an event and people are like, do you work for the German highway? And I'm like, no, no, I don't work for the German highway. <laughs> So for those of you who didn't put a hand up, the Audubon Society is one of the oldest conservation organizations in North America. We were founded in 1905 actually by women trying to protect the extinction of birds uh, due to the feathers and hat trade. And so our background is really this grassroots political adv advocacy organization. But here in California, we do everything from on the ground education at nature centers we own and operate roughly 17,000 acres of property, including a wetland up in Calusa and a 7,000 acre cattle ranch outside of Winters. We do policy work. And really most of my career at Audubon over the last 10 years has been working with rice growers and with wetland managers in the Central Valley to create the habitat that birds need, uh, both the ones that live here year round and also the amazing migratory birds that we get here every fall and winter. And so, you know, you might be a little bit surprised to see a conservationist on a water management and water industry discussion, but everything we do in California when we think about birds comes down to the foundation of water. Because without water, we can't support human life and birds are exactly the same, right? And so we work very closely with farmers and ranchers and wetland managers to think about when, where, and how water is being put on the landscape so that we can get as many benefits as possible out of it for birds and for a resilient ecosystem. So. 
excited to talk a little bit more about the type of positions we're hiring for and the type of skills that we hope people have uh, when we see them enter the workforce. So thank you. Thank you, Megan. Todd? Yeah, thanks, Renee. Um, and uh, like Tim, I also am a proud product of the community college system here in California. I have earned a AA degree many years ago uh, from Hartnell College down in Salinas. And uh, I echo Tim's comments. I think that it took a real unmotivated high school student and uh, uh, provided me with the tools to actually uh, get through the uh, UC system. So I, I just I think that on the ground and, and truly uh, the classwork and everything that really prepared me uh, for what I do today really started there uh, at the community college level. And so, um, and I think we'll talk a little bit more about that later on, and in particular, just the role of, that communications play in, uh, I think, what we do a lot of uh, in telling the story and, and how that started with just having those fundamentals of both written and oral communication. But um, I'm Todd Manley. I, the, as it says there, the Director of Government Relations for the Northern California Water Association. And our organization is a nonprofit association. And we represent the water management entities, as well as the local government entities in the Sacramento Valley. And so our members are mainly on the valley floor, but do go up into the foothills in, with, uh, uh, in Placer County and Nevada County. Um, but by and large, it's uh, on, the, on the valley floor. And um, we run from the Shasta County in the north down to Yolo County and, and Natomas area in the south. And so um, I think that um, one of the interesting things, and I think we're going to get into this a little bit because it has an impact on the jobs that uh, my members are looking for, is the fact that they manage water year round for all beneficial uses in the valley. And so I think historically and, and traditionally, we think of irrigation as happening during the irrigation season. Um, but now the water management entities are managing the resources uh, to benefit the birds in the flyway in the this time of year. Uh, we're having new programs where we're growing food for fish in the winter months. And then of course, the more traditional uh, crops that occur uh, during uh, the irrigation season. And so I think that, you know, exciting for me is I get to spend a lot of time in, in my role at NACWA. While it says Director of Government Relations, uh, we're a shop of six people. And so I wear many hats, uh, but I spend the vast majority of my time working with our members to help them implement projects to promote habitat for Chinook salmon uh, in the valley, as well as uh, create flyway habitat, uh, particularly during this time of year. Thank you. I, I just want to I will say on. one more thing I, I forgot to say. We do also have associate members that include some of the entities that Aaron mentioned, uh, HDR, uh, Ludorf and Scalmanini and West Yost are, are members of our organization. And I was pleased to see that they're uh, hiring uh, and part of the, the mix on hiring folks from community college. Excellent. I just wanna let you know, we're gonna move to a gallery view for the discussion so that we can see everybody's faces in case um, questions or discussion items come up. And so um, Danielle's gonna stop screen sharing this slide uh, we can see each other's faces and then as uh, we go into the next questions and the discussion that these three will have if you have a question you can drop it in the chat or you can raise your hand so we will now be able to see that occurring um, so just to kind of prompt the next discussion and it's up to all of you who wants to answer first or start it how is the ongoing drought affecting the number and types of positions available in water management and what do you project out for about the next three to five years thanks mm -hmm. Do you, do you uh, want to start, Tim, or you want me to? Yeah, let me talk about that from just from a farmer perspective, and then I'll just briefly, uh, Todd, then then uh, talk to you, uh, let you pick that up. As I noted, uh, you know, we've got less water to grow crops. I thought the that Jim did an excellent job of talking about the reaction or the response from farmers. So our first response is to uh, grow less crops uh, and and try to get through that <clears throat> single drought year. Uh, so in that context, as I noted, we grew 20% less acres this last year, uh, and it had a pretty significant impact on the economics of our industry. Not as not an equivalent uh, impact in the number of jobs, so we didn't cut 20% of our workforce. Um, as I'm sure you know, Aaron and others would note, 
you know, employees are valuable things. You don't just go out and find the next one. So we actually, uh, our members were very good. Uh, and you know, both, I think, as a matter of just, you know, being socially responsible as, as well as practical, which farmers always are, tried everything that they could to keep the employees that they had uh, really at all levels uh, employed uh, through this drought. Um, so maybe with that, Todd, I'll stop and you can go next. Sure, thanks, Tim. And yeah, I, I think what I'll do is rather than talking about it from a, a NACWA perspective, I, our, during the drought, our, our employment doesn't change. We're, we're this, the same, but all our, with our members, um, I can talk about that as well. And you know, when you're moving water, really the quantity of water doesn't dictate the number of employees that you need. It, it's still going to be the same amount. And our members saw you know, cuts of at least, you know, 35 to 40% in their water supply this year, but their employment numbers, you know, stayed pretty much the same. And so I think that it's just, you've got to keep the system operating, you have to move the water. And so it just, you know, there might be some some seasonal folks that aren't hired, but by and large, the, the employment stays pretty, pretty much the same. And I'll actually tell a slightly different story. So uh, when the drought hit, we actually needed to bring people on pretty quickly. So one of the things that we saw is the state and federal government have allocated significant funds for drought emergency response. Uh, and that funding hit the ground in a lot of different ways, right? So there were insurance payments that supported people, but from a bird and wildlife perspective, there's actually some very big investments of public funding going out to rice growers and also to wetland managers to pump groundwater in key strategic areas to create habitat to support the tens of millions of birds that are arriving in the Sacramento Valley this time of year. So um, we had to work very quickly to come up with a structure to get that funding out and just big thanks to Tim and Todd for their partnership on that and their advocacy to get that money out on the ground. But it means we hired a lot of field techs who are gonna be going out onto the ground and looking at is the water out there? What is the depth of the water? How are the birds responding? You know, these are shorter term positions, but it is one, an example of how an emergency happened and we had to staff up pretty quickly for it. And that being said, um, drought is the new normal, right? As we look at a future of climate change, we expect to see increasing extreme events. And so having people that are water experts and understand and know how to manage water uh, in drought and in flood and can adapt is something that we're all gonna be looking for in positions going forward in the future. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Um, and then you were talking a little bit about skills, Megan. I know you all have some detailed um, information about the kind of skills that you're seeing are needed now or for the future, like Jim, you were talking about the increased need for some technical expertise. If you could talk a little bit about that specific skills that are needed even for those short-term field tech positions or what you're seeing being, you know, how the positions are changing and skills and training that would be valuable. Let me, uh, yeah, I think from a farm perspective, we, we're at a point where we're make, making a pretty significant pivot, right? So I think the jobs that we need today uh, are sort of the ones that we talked about earlier in the presentation, right? You need folks with technical skills to be able to help you uh, on your farm. So we need agronomists today, right? Which fall into that pest control advisor kind of a bucket, people to help us grow our crop well. Of course, with the caveat with less water, right? So it's, it's harder now to manage a farm rice. It's harder now to manage uh, and uh, with, with less water. So you know, a lot more, uh, uh, focus on agronomics, also remote sensing. Now we're a flooded crop. Those that are familiar with, with rice in, in California, Sacramento Valley, go like, wow, these guys don't do drip. How hard can it be uh, to measure your water? Well, the answer is it's, it's pretty hard, right? You got a big surface. You really only want to keep that water at the ideal depth, not too deep, right? And not too shallow. Uh, so we're starting to see a big wave of remote sensing uh, into our industry. And I think for the next five or so 10 years of 
what can we do in the flooded crops like rice uh, that will help us be even more efficient uh, than we than we are now? And the other is data management, right? As soon as you start pulling in all this data, you got to figure out what it means, what you're gonna what you're gonna do with it. So, those are the folks that our farmers are are looking for uh, today. In addition to sort of just the on-farm, you know, labor, which for us is, and most of the agriculture, you know, high-skilled labor, you at least need somebody that's got, you know, a, a, an associate's degree or somebody who's got some good technical training. But I think as Megan had noted, and in fact, in some ways, we're a little bit competitive now with our conservation partners, right? Uh, in the past, we go out and ask Megan's organization, Point Blue, TNC, and others, hey, we've got these conservation projects on our lands, whether it be for the Pacific Flyway, maybe growing salmon in rice fields and then releasing them back out uh, into the Sacramento River. Can you come help us with that? And they've been fantastic partners over decades for that. You know, help us understand how we can manage our lands to provide uh, even enhanced habitat beyond what we're already doing. Well, increasingly we're hiring those folks onto our own staff. So my last hire uh, was a, uh, a waterfowl biologist from, from UC Davis program, right? So his objective is to now go out and really enhance those benefits uh, from rice growing from a habitat perspective, both during the growing season. And then as Megan had indicated during that, that fallow season where we actually reflood those fields, right? make all of that food that's on that land, about 700 pounds of food per acre of rice, uh, make that as available as possible to as many different species that need them. We need to not just be bugging Megan all the time, right? We need somebody on our staff to be able to go out and, and work with Megan, work with state and federal agencies. And increasingly on the uh, uh, fish biology side. We need biologists to, to be able to help us uh, do the same for fish that we've, the rice industry has really been able to do for birds on the flyway. So we need technicians, we need people with bachelor's and master's degrees and conservation sciences, right? To help us as an agricultural association be able to help our members. But we also see our members are directly competing with folks uh, with some of Megan's hires, right? Large farms will go out and hire a biologist to be able to help them comply with programs they may be enrolled in, uh, to be able to go and understand additional programs that might be a day available through NRCS and others. Uh, you know, how would those apply to my farm? You know, what, what can we do within the context of also growing my crop? So in the future, in addition to sort of those tech jobs, we really need conservation biologists. Uh, we really need folks that aren't quote farmers and, and don't think necessarily about water um, uh, to be able to come alongside because the, the simple truth of farming in the Sacramento Valley is that you need to be able to take that unit of water, acre foot, you need to be able to grow your crop as efficiently as possible. But really the standard that we have today is far beyond that. And that standard is to be able to provide as many benefits as possible as that water moves onto your field and moves off of your field. Does it go to a wildlife refuge? Do we hold that water on a rice field to provide some specific benefit? Do we take fallowed rice fields like those that we had this year? And can we provide additional nesting and upland habitat on those lands? And so, while you may not think about that as being a classic water job, it is directly related with how our farmers, our rice farmers are managing water today. It's not just call it the irrigation district, you know, get some more water on your field because things are looking a little dry. We're so far beyond that, uh, that we're really looking into these other, uh, you know, industries and skill sets that, you know, 20 years ago, a farmer would have never hired a biologist. Well, first of all, now I know where all my candidate pools are. <laughs> Come on, Tim, you got to leave some for the nonprofit. <laughs> now, I'll just build a little bit on, on what Tim is saying. Everything you said is completely true, right? And so I work for a medium sized nonprofit organization. We have about 50 staff in California. And nonprofits that are about our size means 
each staff person does everything, right? So we do everything from checking the mail to doing the science and monitoring the birds to doing the policy and the communications. And so we're really looking for well-rounded candidates that can communicate well, that know how to partner, not just with other conservationists, but know how to partner with unusual stakeholders. I would never say a farmer or a water district is an unusual partner, but in many places of the, the country, it is still seen as an environmentalist working with a farmer is like very shocking. Here in California, we've been doing it for decades. And so we're very good partners, but we look for people that can communicate across stakeholders. We're also looking for unusual candidates, right? Like we want to bring in a diversity of folks who maybe don't come from a traditional conservation background, who bring a different skill set, uh, and then just a plus one on those technical skills. So GIS and remote sensing, like that is such a great skill, even if it's just like a basic level of being able to create those maps and communicate and tell the story, that's incredibly helpful. So um, interpersonal skills, communication, willingness to chip in and do it all and work across boundaries, and willingness to think creatively about water, right? To Tim's point, it's no longer just about one drop for one purpose. It's about how much can we get out of each acre foot of water and each acre of land. Yeah, and thanks. And I, I think, boy, Megan and Tim, as usual, did a great job of describing it. And I think just to echo some of that, I, I think for, us and within the Northern California Water Association, as Megan said, that communication is key. I think in part because some of the, I think uh, the, I guess, historic kind of uh, uh, cliches about, you know, ag uh, versus urban and ag versus environment, you know, we don't do that. And we're all working together. We collectively work to manage the resource. And so I think just being able to communicate that and to really describe what's happening on the ground has been key. And so I think when we're hiring folks, um, you know, like I said, we're a shop of six, but everyone can write. Uh, and just because that's the way that we get the word out. And so that's been just really key, having those ability to communicate in a very efficient manner. And quite frankly, being able to take some of the stuff that is very technical and be able to be, describe it in a way that a general audience can understand has been key as well. Because I think, you know, we all talk about things in CFS and acre feet and, you know, no one else does. And so we, we need to be able to communicate that to, to folks in a way that they can understand. Um, and so I think that that's important. I think from our members side of things, one of the things that I've seen in the now two decades that I've been with, with NACWA is this real transition uh, towards a more technical aspect of water management. And this has been in response to just advances in automation that have occurred, and, you know, just technological advances. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, that as Tim mentioned, kind of that uh, remote sensing, uh, the automation of systems where they're, they're utilizing, you know, cell service as well as, you know, just some of the technology that's out there to, uh, you know, remotely control pumps and uh, water uh, elevation uh, uh, management, you know, SCADA systems and the like. And so I think more and more you were getting away from the tradition of the employee at the irrigation district riding around in the pickup truck with the shovel in the, the bed. And now it's more often that you're seeing a laptop in the cab. And so having those employees that have that basic understanding of how to utilize the laptop to be able to do their job more efficiently is something that's in high demand. Uh, with the measurement requirements that we have nowadays uh, that Tim hinted uh, on, you know, just being able to measure at that turnout level uh, within the district requires the, you know, use of a measurement device that's carried around by, you know, uh, folks as well. And they need to be able to utilize that. It operates in the way that many of the districts are doing this is a device that's set in, you measure for a specific amount of time and it communicates with Bluetooth to the laptop that's in the truck. And so being able to utilize that equipment, but also, you know, you're 20, 30 miles away from the, you know, the, uh, the office. And if there's a problem with that, being able to fix it. And so I see that more and more is becoming, you know, part of the skill set that our members are looking for. And so they're definitely looking for people that, that have the ability to, to do that and that understanding. Uh, thank you for that very um, detailed drill down into the kind of skills that you're looking for. You mentioned 
uh, the competitiveness for certain positions and recruiting for certain positions. So curious about that. What, how do you currently recruit candidates for the positions that you see in water management? And are you working with any pipeline programs, either with community college, K through 12 or other partners? So uh, Carrie and I have been in some discussions about how we can improve the dialogue between ag needs in the Sac Valley uh, and, and community colleges. And, and what I think we hear the same thing that I've heard in, in Valley Vision now for years, right? Which is, you know, we need folks that have these skills and you look around and, and there's two things they're not. One is available and two is interested. So uh, not really working with any pipeline programs. I think in the SEC Valley, it's my great hope uh, that we're able to develop uh, a real robust dialogue. I mean, it doesn't really matter if you're at SunSuite uh, and you're on the processing side of a, of, a, of a prune, right? Not a overly glamorous, you know, product. Not, not that rice is overly glamorous either. Um, and, and be able to, to know that you've got employees coming out of a program that you can, you know, you can hire folks that you can frankly support through their educational uh, uh, program. I think the other challenge that we have, um, and I'll let my colleagues speak to this, is, you know, it's hard to get people that are genuinely interested in agriculture. First of all, they don't know it. And then if they do know it, they don't know production agriculture, right? They don't, you know, and that's probably at least as much our fault as, as anything else. So, when folks in the communities in the Sac Valley think about their kids going off and going to college and getting a good job, okay, it's like never to come back to work in the rice industry. It's never to come back and work at a rice mill or you know, work for a logistics company in the Sac Valley. And we need to change that because these are fantastic jobs. Um, you know, I'm a kid that moved back to my hometown. Why? Because you like your hometown, right? It's really awesome if you can get a job there, right? That that pays. And maybe your folks didn't have that job, and that's why you went out and finished your education or, or even got advanced education. So we need to be able to talk about how cool, right, working in agriculture is because you get to work with conservation organizations like like Audubon. It's cool because if you're a a STEM person, you can go and, you know, really move water and move it around a field and understand stuff that, you know, makes a real practical difference today uh, for that person that you're working with, right? Whether it be an individual farmer or an irrigation district. And so I, I would just probably offer that as, a, as an overview. I know both Todd and, and Megan, by the way, I put a footnote in there, Carrie, for you is that I had a great conversation with Megan yesterday. And I think it's probably in everybody's uh, initial real strong positive reaction of, can we start adding some conservation? Can we start adding some water management specific district needs and some of these other things that the three of us have been talking about? You know, to that dialogue in the Sacramento Valley so that it's broader than just, you know, what food processors and, and what the farming, you know, production agriculture needs. Uh, do you want to add on? I can talk a little bit about how we recruit, if, or you can go first. Wh whichever you prefer. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I think, the, you know, Tim hit on it. Uh, we have not done necessarily a pipeline. What, what we have started doing is doing uh, kind of a, it, we called it a scholarship, but basically it was helping out with graduate students at CSU Chico uh, with pro projects that they are doing for their, their thesis, their master's thesis or whatever to, to, you know, investigate some of the fishery biology stuff. But I think more and more uh, as Tim says, we've got to start thinking about that differently and really getting, um, looking at it at the community college level as well and with internships, right? I think that that oftentimes is how, if you're a student, you can get exposure to uh, an industry that maybe you aren't as familiar with uh, and have that in a, you know, where you could kind of, for lack of a better term, you know, test drive uh, those type of occupations and jobs. I, I do know from our members, one of the struggles they have in hiring historically has been they're oftentimes in rural areas and getting a, you know, employee that's willing to either move 
to that rural area or commute to that rural area has been a, a real barrier to um, getting you know, qualified and good candidates to apply for them uh, for those jobs. And so I think that that's, that's good. I think er earlier, one of the things that I'm excited about is uh, there was mention of it earlier that at Yuba College, there's this watershed science program that's being started and our uh, member, the uh, Yuba Water Agency is involved with that. And so hopefully that will be providing a, a template that we can look to in, in, in future years. Well, I'm glad you brought up internships. I'm gonna drop in the chat Audubon's internship page. So uh, that's a great way to sort of get into the pipeline with our organization. The link I dropped in is actually our national internship page. Uh, we recruit interns from across the country and other states that have Audubon programs also recruit. So it's kind of a great way to travel for a season if you wanted to do some bird surveys or restoration or things like that. Um, I think we could do a better job, honestly, identifying pipelines and working with community colleges or other colleges or academic institutions because we're a mission-driven organization, we typically post our jobs on our website, and then we really hope that people that love conservation come and look for the jobs, which is not always the most effective way to do it. We also post on a lot of the um, more traditional conservation websites. So like indeed.com is one where there's a lot of nonprofit organizations post their jobs there. And then we try to put it out through listservs, but I will admit that we could do a much better job of that Part of our challenge is, you know, our human resources department is in New York and we're in California and uh, I have a full time job doing conservation on the ground. So often things like job recruitment don't go, uh, don't get as much attention as they should get. So being really intentional about having pipelines like Tim is talking about, I think, would be a good step forward for Audubon. Thank you so much. It looks like um, Todd McPherson has his hand raised. Todd, do you have a question for the panel? Yeah, I do. Can y'all hear me? I never quite know which computer. Yes. Is. Okay, yeah. good. Um, so I'm a high school teacher in Sacramento. Um, I have a new-ish um, academy, a CTE academy at Luther Burbank High School called the Urban Ag Academy. Um, and I've been in yawn and off conversations with Dave, who's right up the light rail station, you know, CRC, Consumers River College is there. Um, and also other partners on this call um, the Center for Land-Based Learning that we do some internship work with them and some, some stuff around ag and exploration, sustainable ag and, and conservation um, work. But my question is specifically to the panel and then anybody else, I'm curious as we're building um, this academy, trying to divert or inspire, uh, depending on how you want to look at it, kids at the high school age from an urban environment that aren't traditionally you know, they're, they're not ag kids. They're not particularly interested or know that they are because they don't have a lot of exposure. Um, what kind of perspective do you want them coming in with their soft skills to get into the industry in this kind of new, new reality that's a lot more collaborative where it seems like a lot of the college programs are geared towards you, you kind of focus on one skill, one area. And then it sounds like now the industry is broadening out again. Like, how should I, as the director of the program, best prep the kids to be able to go in with, with you know, this perspective? Um, I'd, I'd love, because we're designing, we're rebuilding post COVID, it's a nice time to rethink some of this stuff and, mm -hmm. and build some of the collaboration. And I think there's ways to create this pathway and there's parts that are there. Um, kind of as a side, Robin Kroc, who some of you guys know, actually took me out to an ag program when I was working in nonprofits. And that was part of what inspired me to get involved and, and start teaching. So uh, that's just a funny little side in connection with Valley Vision. But I'm really curious as to how you would recommend or what perspective, you got a blank slate of high, high school students from diverse backgrounds, different perspectives coming in, how can we channel them in um, get them excited to be part of this industry that's so great um, and in ag and natural resource management. Very cool. I'm going to let one of my colleagues start this section off. So Megan or Todd. Man, that's a, that is a great question. <laughs> Todd. Uh, you know, I think our organizations are struggling with exactly the same thing. I mean, part of it is, at least in my opinion, not teaching high school, so take this with a grain of salt, like having kids 
see the the range of opportunities that are out there, right? Like when I so I do conservation for a living. I didn't know that you could do that. I actually had to go back to graduate school because I did my undergraduate in political science because I didn't know conservation was actually a thing, right? And then I got out of undergrad and I was like, oh wait, I can actually have a career where I do good things for the environment and someone pays me for it and I get to be outside and I work with farmers, like this is great. And then I didn't have the right education for it. So I had to go back to get another degree. I also could have you know, potentially done more internships. That's another path forward rather than getting an advanced degree. So I think the sooner in people's educational pathways that we can show them the range of opportunities that are out there and then help them identify what are the core aspects that they need to go into the different areas. So like if you are gonna do the work that Todd was talking about, you probably need more of a technical background. Whereas for the role that I have, it's much more about policy project management sort of generalist role. And so identifying those that want to go that slightly more technical route versus those that want to go the more project management policy route, I think there's a slightly different pathway between two of them. But then encouraging folks to have those cross-cutting interpersonal communication skills, which frankly are needed in any career at this point. What would you add, Todd and Tim? I, th I think that's a really good start, Megan. And I think that... Um... You know, one of the exciting things about just how ag is evolving is that, you know, the kids that have different passions, be it conservation, be it, you know, uh, engineering or, you know, anything else, communications is there's a role to play and an opportunity within agriculture to them to have their passion and, and, and to have a, a job in ag. I would say, you, you, Todd, something struck with me when you said in a post-COVID, I think what one of the things that we might be able to do is, you know, Tim and, and Megan and I spent a lot of time putting on tours and we take folks out into the field and really show them on the ground just how this lays out and how we're managing these water resources for the environment, for agriculture on the same land. And so I think that having that opportunity and I offer that up that, you know, when we get into this post-COVID time frame when people are more comfortable getting together again and getting on a bus in close proximity with each other, there is an opportunity. The great thing too is we're, you know, within a 20 minute, 30 minute drive of Sacramento, you can get out, get into the field. They could see water management, you know, the, the habitat that's ground that's being managed for that and agricultural land all in one place and really allow them to have a you know, uh, an upfront conversation of Q and A of just what this what this is and what how that meshes with what their interests are. Yeah, I would just maybe add just one one point of of something that you could do for us, Todd. Um, you know, we're successful in our jobs and we hire people without question that can relate well to people that are different than them. Um, you know, I could hang around a bunch of farmers and slam my fist on the back of the tailgate of the pickup truck and say, you know, by God, it's my right to do whatever. And I'd be real popular in rice country. Um, but that's not the job that we have in front of us, right? My job is to work with water districts. My job is to work with folks like Megan. My folks, my job is to work with people at Valley Vision, right? That I was probably the only production ag guy or, or person in the room at all. Um, and just be able to communicate, not to get offended, not to have my ideas be so in front of me that I can't see what the other person's perspective is. Um, and that would be huge. And the second one is, and, and I'll, ju I'll just be clear without trying to be impolite about it, is that, you know, California is the number one ag production state in the nation. We grow a lot of crops almost all of those acres, certainly almost all of the economics of that are what we call production agriculture, right? Agriculture that's at a scale that allows you to uh, hire employees, uh, farm with your brothers and sisters and your cousins and, and, and your uncles uh, and be able to do that. And so, you know, in the context of the discussion about sustainable and local and the rest of that, that's really a great entry point to what I consider to be you know, the bulk of what ag is in the state, right? And that's that's quite frankly where I think some of the more interesting jobs are, are, are quite frankly going to be. There certainly be more diverse. 
I think, in the areas that we're talking about, just because of scale, right? Farmer farming 10 acres for, you know, uh, you know farmers markets, et cetera, not going to be able to hire a biologist, right? And so if that's what, if folks know those opportunities, maybe that gets them past that point of entry. Thank you. I see that Dave has his hand raised. Dave, did you have a comment on this question? I just kind of wanted to throw my two cents in really quick. And, and, and coming as both an educator and a, an employer or former employer, a business owner, um, one of the things that I find is you've got a lot of folks at the high school level and, and even below at the, at the K-12, that, that whole section, it, it, and nothing against them, but they've been in education their whole life. And they don't know a lot about agriculture. And, and even when I was teaching uh, in Clovis High School down in Fresno County, uh, we had a vice principal who used to say, I'm not quite sure why we have an ag program. <laughs> and, and, and I'm like, you are like miles away from, you know, this rich agricultural county, the biggest ag county in California. Come on. Anyway, long story short is, is we used to do administrators night. Remember, I don't know if they still do that. Um, but this would be one of those things that we need to reinstitute or bolster and, and get industry and our ag teachers and our counselors, these people that, that these high schoolers are going to for guidance and let them know. I understand that horticulture and agriculture are not sexy. They're not going to be the hot five, 10 jobs. You know, everybody wants to be a, a millionaire right out of college or right out of high school doing tech and things like that. But we've got to show them this integration of conservation and agriculture and this direction that we're heading and addressing these climate change issues and that there are viable careers and well-paying jobs that are out there. I, I think that's just going to be something that we need to, as, as an industry, as a group, get together and, and really target that audience. So that way, these, these counselors and educators that are, that are advising these young students say, hey, look, this is a real viable opportunity for you because they, they themselves don't know. We still have uh, counselors that are saying, you don't want to get into landscaping. That's just a pickup and a lawnmower, and you're not going to make a living and raise a family. And, and that's, right. that's not true at all. They don't understand the technical skill and specialty that's involved in, in our diverse industry. So, Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. I wanted to, um, Kenya, I know that you had put some comments in the chat and uh, Megan responded. Did you have any additional question that you wanted to bring forward? Not sure if you have audio. Is it Kenya? Yes, I'm there. Hold on, sorry. It's okay. <laughs> Trying to too many screens. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, she did answer pretty much most of my question. I think um, all of you are, are saying what we in K twelve want to hear industry say. Um, I think it's more of sometimes accessing your different in individual organizations and knowing who to reach out to. So you have a teacher like Todd who, you know, he's teaching a class all day and hopefully they have a CTE coordinator or someone who then could reach out to your organization to help him make that connection to you. Who in your organization would that person be? So would, would he start with your HR department? Could he start with one of you? I mean, we know that the best way to get kids into these industries is to expose them and to show them all of the wealth and multitude of jobs that are out there that they have never heard of. But we also, you know, again, Todd's teaching a class all day too. So he, for him to have to reach out to you is really, um, it's not something he can do on his own. So other people are gonna to have to do that for him, but we also need to know where's our in. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's such an interesting question, right? Because we all know that this type of outreach and connection is so important to do, and we're all so busy, right? With 110 exactly. things that need to get done. I will say from Audubon's perspective, we have local chapters throughout the state. We have 48 local chapter organizations. So most of the counties in California have a local chapter. Many of them do in-school programs or do programming. And so 
that would be my recommendation with where to start because our statewide program staff are generally pretty focused on conservation implementation. But if you don't know who your local chapter is, we can often connect you with that local chapter. Uh, and those will be people that are in your community. They tend to be volunteers, not professionals, but they can talk about conservation um, and they can you know, help provide resources. But you're highlighting a really important area that I think both of our sectors, both education and the professional sector could invest more in. Absolutely. Sure. I know that's an unsatisfying answer, but it's- No, <laughs> it's, a, it's a start and, and that's, that's, that's all we need is to get a foot in the door, right? So <laughs> it is definitely a start. Thank you, Megan. So I, you know, the reality is the three of us work very closely together all the time on everything, right? And uh, so I think, you know, following up on what Todd had said, you know, I think from Rice's perspective, you know, send me an email, I'll, I'll put my email in the chat. Uh, I'd be the point of best contact. I think we could probably put together a, a couple of sort of, you know, tours or demonstrations or something. Uh, keep it within sort of what we, I would consider to be sort of the manageable four corners of the, you know, of, of the other nine million things that I like Todd, where there's six of us. And so, uh, you know, that's the reality, but we could certainly, I think for the Sacramento Valley, the fact that we've got a lot of ag close and the fact that the three of us have some great working relationships, be able to, you know, put together something in some time frames that work, probably focus first on the ag educators and counselors, right? Um, and and be able to uh, you know provide you all some a tool right to be able to help you recruit the other thing that and Carrie and I've talked about this over time I think that is there I just need to find some time to put against it and in all honesty that's going to be after this drought because if last year was hard next year may be like way harder um, is. You know, I, I think a number of our, our organizations, our, our farmers, our, our mills, you know, if you just told them, look, you, you need an internship program and, and, and here's the folks to call at the local community college district, they would do that because, again, because our jobs are personal, right? That farmer is going to have an internship for some students over a period of time. I almost guarantee you that if, if, if there's a fit among there, you know, there'll be an opportunity for that student, you know, past, the, past just the educational piece of it, right? Especially, you know, if you're that student and, and I was one, right? I, I don't want to leave the Sierra foothills. I liked it. My family was here. Um, you know, if I could have found a job, you know, that, that was here, that, that fit for me, that wasn't the electrical wholesale business, I would have saved 10 years in San Jose, um, which was fine, but, you know, it was 10 years, right? And I've come back now. And so um, I think we could do that to really be able to put some internships together so that people have a place to point those students that, that have that interest. Thank you so much. I'm going to hand yeah. it over to Thanks. Carrie. Oh, Todd, I'm sorry. Did you have something you wanted to contribute? Uh, just, just briefly, I, I think Kenya, you'd, you'd mentioned in the comments of for like a 16 to 18 year old, um, we did have an internship program and it usually was uh, someone at least entering kind of it finished with high school and maybe entering into to that. Uh, but I'll, I'll be honest with you, it, it, our program kind of withered on the vine and, and not for any, it wasn't any decision that we made. It just became a bandwidth issue. And, and we unfortunately, we just had a summer where we didn't do it. And then that just became the new norm. And so I, I appreciate your, your question because it does make me think that it would be something we, we need to have a discussion about, about you know, re-engaging it because it is a, just a great way to get a, us to get exposure to folks that um, you know, could potentially be future employees. And so I, I think that that, that benefit is, is two way uh, for sure. Um, and then from kind of a high school perspective and Megan, this I'm uh, just gonna ask, I, I know that on with certain schools, that there's like an egg salvage program or something that's done with some of the local schools that might be, you know, to back to Todd's original question, might be that exposure to kind of ag and conservation and, and just a, a real, you know, one day type of a thing, just to at least get folks out and in, literally into the field uh, to where they could see kind of that symbiotic relationship between the environment and agriculture and, and what it takes and, and maybe get some folks that might not think about an ag career to, to 
to see what that entails that's different than just being on a tractor or you know working in, in ag itself can i piggyback on i'll try to be quick um i use cheap theatrics to get my students um todd you're doing that you get them out out of the classroom get your hand in the dirt and then you got them trapped right in a pretty cool place because a it's out of the classroom and then you can start talking to them uh from there uh th the other th and that works man i taught tractor driving sorry ted for over 20 years and i've got four thousand students out there have driven tractors uh, most of them don't do it for, probably none of them do it for a living but that's how i got them that's pretty cool to come in and drive a tractor um and, and it works um I have a, a student right now who's San Jose master's electrical engineering. He's one of those traditional, non-traditional students. And, and, and so when I started talking about ag and water, um, uh, he's gonna change his life. I mean, and he wants to get out of San Jose by the way. And I can understand it because I lived there for a while. But uh, again, you know, I just call it cheap theatrics, man. You've got to get their attention um get them out of the class and get them get them out young so i'll leave it at that thank you carrie i'm going to have you we're getting close to time here and i know there's some opportunities to partner with the community colleges as well and any uh any final thoughts you have i i know you're going to say thank you i also want to say thank you to the the panelists and the speakers that we had today this is a great discussion and great information um carrie what, what do you have for us? Yeah, Todd, it's, I see Todd, you have your hand raised. Do you have something real quick? I don't want you to not get to ask your question. Oh, you're... oh if it's if it's me with my hands raised, I just uh, was responding to direct messages and didn't take it down. Oh, so great, okay. okay. I, I'm all good, but thank you for backing up us super busy teachers. The, the most mileage I've ever got outside of just getting kids planting stuff in the garden is, a field trip that I think it was the Rangeland Trust put together and it had four or five different stations. And we moved, I think, three bus loads of kids from my school through and they learned about so many different things. And I still have alum come back and talk about that trip. So if some of the local nonprofits can help arrange things like that and support each other. That's huge for, for us teachers who, who can then arrange the buses and get out there and the kids can literally get in the field and experience all these different things. Yeah, um, and, and that's exactly right. And I will say just working in this sector, I, it, ag people are really very generous with their time to try and educate um, students. So um, I, I, I want to say that as part of kind of one of the projects I've worked on, um, I actually just put it in the chat. It's called you go to www.spotlightonag.com. Um, that is a pro that's a, an app we've developed uh, the regional directors and myself have put that together and it is a career exploration tool that you can use in the classroom. Um, we're adding about 15 careers. I think there's about 50 now, but we're adding about 15 uh, every month. Um, and uh, if you've got uh, somebody who is out in the field, we really tried to make sure that the, the app showcased um, people that, that looked like our students that were, you know, aren't a bunch of, uh, we didn't want to have, you know, a, a 60 year old farmer out. I mean, not that we don't, God love them all, but we wanted our students to see themselves in these videos. And so feel free to take a look. You can even, um, it's very easy. It gives directions on how to download it to your phone, um, how to get it on your phone. So it will show as an app. Um, and it not only gives uh, the, it gives us some short videos about what each uh, job uh, representative does, as well as salary information. And then there's a location feature that will take, um, it, it looks at whatever the job is. So if the job is in plant science, it will put them in contact with the community college that is closest to their location. And, um, and so and we're actually looking at expanding that out for other, for all the other CTE sectors in this region, as well as in the Central Valley. So um, I invite you guys to check that out and um, our industry people. I, I can't thank you all enough for, for participating and our faculty. Um, it certainly is good to see that, you know, we're all trying to work together to, to get through this drought um, and reach out to me if you have 
job people that you want me to put on the, the app, reach out to me if you're having a hard time uh, getting in contact with industry partners that you can uh, to kind of maybe make some contact for tours or, or questions. I'm happy to help out with that. Um, and I want to thank the Valley Vision Group for all of their hard work on the meeting. And we want to be respectful of your time. So I think we're going to wrap up. And Renee, are you good or anything else? I am good and I agree with you. Thanks so much to everyone for your time and expertise that was shared today. We love the networking going on in the chat, the questions coming from the audience as well. So happy to have our K through 12 pipeline partners on here as well as community college and industry representatives. And just a special thank you to the panel. We know there's a lot of calls on your time and we appreciate you bringing the information related to skills and occupations um, directly to the doorstep for educators. So. Thank you, everyone. We hope you have a great weekend and we'll be sending out the recording and all presentation materials in the next couple of days. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.